everyone. I'm Reverend Carla, and welcome to Spirituality Matters, a podcast that focuses on the intersection of spirituality and humanity. Let's settle in and find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together is just as sacred and meaningful as if we were sitting beside one another. So let's get started. Here I am, still in Arizona, still in my little podcast booth also known as my hotel room. It works, I guess. All right. (laughs) All right. Today's podcast is entitled The Fallacy of the Trinity and the Harm It Has Caused. This podcast is inspired by my blog by the same name, which is now available at numasoul.com. I get these questions a lot. I'm often asked what I believe, and I rarely answer those questions specifically, and there's a lot of reasons why I don't, but primary, primarily the reason is I don't answer these questions is because a lot of times it's not about having a discussion. It's about the person uh, proving me wrong. And that has happened like since day one, since I started teaching online, at least that's been my experience. And I can tell the difference between someone who is truly wanting to enter into a dialogue and someone who is just quote, meaning no offense, genuinely curious. Your teachings are so interesting, but the minute I do answer, they are going to come back and slam me with Bible verses, label me a heretic and just try to exhaust me. I've had people who I've literally gone back and forth 20 times talking to them. And I look back on those times and this was, this has been several years ago. And I realized that I was still trying to get validation from them. I was entering into these conversations willingly, hoping that they would accept me when I finally realized that that was never going to happen. And it was the reason I left church in the first place. I just stopped interacting with them because they are inviting me to enter into a conversation where they are creating the rules around it. They are assuming that I'm going to enter into this conversation willingly so they can then filter my beliefs through their belief system and then come out and prove me wrong. I'm not playing that game anymore. But it's not uncommon that people will ask me, what do I believe in the Trinity? What do I believe in Jesus? Uh, Do I believe in the Holy Spirit? Do I believe in miracles? Do I believe in uh, tarot cards? Do I think that uh, psychic mediums really exist? Is there heaven? I mean, all these different things. I, I, I answer them when I know that the person asking the question is doing so from a place of true intention that they're trying to reconcile some of their own work that they're doing on their spiritual journey. But I feel like I need to say this. Anything that I say here is not to mock someone else, what someone else believes. I'm not doing that. I never say I don't believe in faith healings. I never say that I don't believe in the speaking of tongues. I never say that I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Because I think whatever element of spirituality that is available to humanity, it manifests itself in different ways, even in the most homophobic churches. I can't explain what that is. I can't explain that. I know that my last church was incredibly homophobic, even though they will say, oh, we love everyone. No, if you're not officiating same-sex marriages. And if you're not allowing them into leadership, don't tell me you're welcoming. You're homophobic. You're taking your beliefs and you're filtering them through your, your biblical lens that tells you that being gay is a sin. That is a homophobic position. Because if you're not standing up for human rights, if you're not using your voice to stand up for human rights and Uh, pushing back on those who are trying to especially now annihilate the rights of the LGBTQIA plus community, then you are using your beliefs to support your homophobia. There's no arguing this. But yet some of the most powerful transformations I had were in that church. 
So I think it's a matter of what is it that we do that helps us become a better, better version of ourselves. I keep repeating this better version of ourselves to elevate the human condition and leave the world a better place than we found it. That is true, authentic spirituality. Anything else is a selfish kind that just perpetuates the, the, the institution and to create a self-fulfilling prophecy that allows that institution to continue to flourish and, and keep that little microcosm of community together and funded through their beliefs. And like I said, I can't explain why the speaking of tongues, which I have experienced and I have witnessed, manifests itself in one way, but yet in an, in another church, it doesn't. And I told this story in our Patreon community where I was talking about how um, there is actually chanting and they call it more of a, a chanting, a mindless chanting, but an elevation of a meditation state that's so prominent that you lose your ability to find words inside Buddhism meditation. And so it's not just inside this Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit isn't just part of the Christian centric belief system. There's something happening inside just humanity that allows us to, to transcend beyond our physical experiences to connect with this holy, divine, transcendent presence that's also connected to our indwelling presence. So you'll see me start to lose my words and, lose, and, and become broad with my definitions because the only choice I have then is if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to try to filter it through the explanation of the Bible. And I won't do that because I think that these spiritual experiences go far beyond any one religion. They're available to us all, but then really the test becomes how do we become better versions of ourselves? So mocking those doesn't do anybody any good. I think holding people accountable for how then they use them to create a better world is what we should be talking about. So with all of that said, we are going to talk today about a letter that I had received that, uh, an email that I had received where someone was asking me, uh, what I believed about this, um, uh, hold on. I'm trying to find it here. Just a minute. She was asking me what I believed about the Trinity and she wrote it and it was so sweet. She said, thank you for the many ways we can explore our deconstruction as well as understand the ways Christianity continues to oppress the marginalized. Rev. Carla, in your de deconstruction, are you still a believer in the Trinity, that Jesus is the way to heaven? And I'm going to share a little bit more about what she wrote in a minute because I did respond to this in a video and I expanded on it into a, a, a teaching about the Trinity inside Patreon, but I wanted to offer a little bit more here as well, because people struggle with these things and they don't know what to do. You finally come to this point when you are deconstructing your faith and you are just detangling from all your beliefs, you come face to face. One day you will come face to face and you'll go, what am I going to do about Jesus? what do I do with this? Because it, it can really be a major life and faith crisis because we were taught that Jesus was supposed to be this constant pre presence. We pray to for, and thank him for our presence in our lives, whether it's a parking space or someone in our families healed from cancer, or we find a hundred dollar bill at the bottom of our purse. Everything is manifest from this place of believing in Jesus, because we are literally, we are taught, taught that he literally walks beside us, like literally we can call on his name and boom, he is there. It doesn't matter that the woman in the wheelchair is at the same parking lot and didn't get that parking space because, Hey, it doesn't matter. You're church and you're spiritual and you're good to go. So thank you, Jesus. And amen. It does create a selfish type of spirituality. It, 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 it actually affirms that exclusive Christian club that you are found in favor and other people who sit outside of that are not. Now, so many of us, when we get to this point too, it's very common that you'll start to feel guilty 
about entering this sacrilegious zone of even considering what are we going to do about Jesus? Because it just feels wrong. If this, if, if the lives and teachings of Jesus can't be true, are we throwing everything out with the proverbial bathwater? Are we throwing the baby Jesus out in this, in this bathwater? Are we really going to do that? And I think it's important to say that when you get to this place and you start to feel like, okay, I've entered a sacrilegious space in my deconstructing, honey, you entered that space. The minute you started questioning your faith, you entered that space. There's no one that's sitting inside, uh, especially evangelical church who thinks that you're not a heretic, who thinks that your faith is weak. They cannot believe anything else about you because then that also challenges their faith. So you might as well go ahead and face this and get the job done because not doing it is going to leave you bound to some things that, that are going to limit how you show up in the, your, the world and how you're able to reclaim your spirituality. So let's just go all in because the alternative is to just stay stagnant, or you could go back to church where you will be they will, your, your church friends will happily remind you that you need to recommit and resubmit and stop questioning. Just put your spirituality on autopilot and sit back down in the church pews and be quiet. Not for me. No, thank you. So here we are. It's time that we face what we, what we believe about Jesus. Now, some might say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm done with it all. Because if Jesus what I believe about Jesus isn't real, then what part of my life is real? And they will just quit that, quit what they're doing. But, and a lot of that comes from this place of duality where we were taught in our lives, either it's this way or it's the highway, either you believe this or you're going to hell, either you believe that Jesus uh, resurrection or you're going to hell, either you believe that Jesus is the son of God and you accept him as your Lord, the savior, or you're going to hell. This duality thinking serves a patriarchal religious structure because if you're indoctrinated in it, then you have to go all in rejecting anything else out there, including your neighbor and saying, well, I, I like them. They're good. And I like it that they always have butter available for me when I ask, but too bad they're going to hell when Jesus comes back. And you're okay with it. You learn that that is the way that you're supposed to live. But there is another way to live. Non-duality tells us that we can look for another option. Another option that says, non-duality says, let's look at this table of humanity and say, at what point did certain people decide that they were the gatekeeper of it? That they got to decide who gets to have seat at these tables. and then block it from other people who don't get to sit there. It's when you look at it from that kind of perspective, it's ridiculous to think that anybody thinks that they're the gatekeeper of it, but somehow Christianity has moved extended far beyond that. And it started early with its uh, marriage to power, to political power. So you start to see this. So, when, even if your Bible tells you differently, even if what you're feeling as you're trying to work through this and you're saying, oh, I don't, I, I've always believed that Jesus is the son of God and that the father, son, and Holy ghost are the Trinity. And now what am I doing? Why am I even doing this? As I said, in the last podcast, you have to trust the, uh, the, the journey because if we remember this duality, duality, most of our teaching was most of our indoctrination was taught to us in duality. Duality serves to separate and exclude. Non-duality serves to expand and invite. That's the difference. Where do you want to live? Instead of getting down into the just the granular and say, but this, what about this? Believe, what about this first? No. Where do you want to live? And if you want to live in non-duality and you want to move towards that, then choose that path and move towards it. Because how can duality be true? How can, how can humanity survive in either or? It can't. It's how we build these systems of oppression that ensure that only the powerful will remain in power. 
so we we move towards non-duality which means that we can safely and respectfully look about what we believe about Jesus it means that we can discover a new way of understanding Jesus outside our religious heritage. And it means that we take into context the historical, societal, and religious structures of that time to see what these writers were trying to tell us about Jesus that could point us to where, what they knew at the time and what they thought where we were going as a collective humanity. And what happens when we do that? Well, we discover that the Trinity is not a part of the Bible. It was not a part of the original Christianity. Paul never spoke of it. It's not part of Paul's theology. Yes, the Paul, where most Christians build their theology, their ideology and values around them, you know, the ones that tell me that I don't have the right to preach. That Paul never talked about the trilogy. I'm sorry, the Trinity <laughs> trilogy. Maybe there's a book out there or two after that. One of my heroes is Bishop John Shelby Spong. And here's what he had to say about the Trinity. Quote, the Trinity is a human definition of God. The Trinity is not a description of God. It is rather a description of the human experience of God couched in the language of fourth century Greek speaking Europe, end quote. So it's a description of the human experience of God. So a human ex experience of God would show that the humans were trying to reconcile this, this deity, this, this deification of Jesus and the only way they saw that being together is if they could trinitize, if you will, him with God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That language made sense to them at that time. It didn't to Paul because he never wrote about it. So moving on, because the, the, the next thing you'll often hear people say is, well, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except to me. John 14, 6, boom, get out of my face, Carla. Well, yeah, that verse has been used a lot to justify the exclusive Christian club that unless you're doing this, ain't nobody else going to get in here because, hey, we're morally and spiritually superior than everybody else. And we're going to let you know when we come into Waffle House with our Jesus pin flashing and we're going to sit there and we won't tip. We we'll might give you a Jesus coupon at the end because, you know, this is the worldly side of things. We don't have to be a part of that. And tipping is part of that. You just should be grateful that I was in your presence after Sunday church and I came in here to eat before I go home and have my nap. Oh, I'm sure I've agitated somebody now, but it's the truth. Look at the article that talks about how people are embarrassed to be associated with so many Christians who don't tip well as part of their faith. But this verse, John 14, 6, has been used to justify the exclusive Christian club that lends itself to the moral and superior complex running around these days. So it's an option to read it that way. You, if, that, if that serves your faith, if that serves your faith, your spiritual community, that your faith filtered through your spiritual experience, filtered through that belief serves you, that's great. Go for it. The problem becomes when you believe that, and because you believe that, you have the right to weaponize that belief and suppress other people's rights. Then that becomes religious oppression. That's what we're pushing back on. If that serves you, that's fine. But it doesn't mean it serves the entirety of humanity. People will talk about Jesus, as if he created this exclusive Christian club when he didn't, he was a Jew. He was all, he was honoring his Jewish traditions, even throughout the Jew, the G, Jesus story. And he pushed back on those religious people because they were oppressing others, using their religion to oppress others. But there are other ways to interpret this scripture, but we just need to take a back, a pause here and listen, the writer of John 
was writing to a specific group of people who were, they were living in one place, one little microcosm, trying to figure out how to reconcile their spirituality. And they knew about Jesus. And this is what made sense to them. Bishop Spong also wrote, quote, that was a testimony to their experience. It was not a prescription claiming that they possess the only doorway into the God, into the only God of Jesus. This is an attempt on the part of the early disciples of Jesus to validate their experience journeying through Jesus into the mystery of the God they had known in Israel. It is amazing to me that this would someday be used to judge all of the other religious traditions as unworthy, wrong or even evil. This passage in particular is particular, not exclusive. The gospel writer wants this specific group of people to recognize and name the distinctiveness of their identity as a people of faith. I heard somebody tell me one time that what if the actual writing is not, I am the way, but I am a way. And it rocked my world because I was deconstructing at the time and I was truly facing my what to do about Jesus moments. And what if he had said, I am a way. If I can help you find a way. What, what is that? Shift? How does that shift it for you? And I had never thought of it that way. And then you go on to read other scholars who say that the vast majority of John probably wasn't even said by Jesus. Those quotes were put in so much later by other writers that, that Jesus didn't say them, that they were given to him. Those words were given to him and attributed to him by other people who were trying to reconcile the Jesus narrative into the burgeoning Christian movement. So it served them to have that as part of their story. Now, I know some of you are hearing this and saying that's her heretical. Is it? Is it? Isn't our entire spiritual experience about questioning and doubting and moving closer to the experience of the divine instead of meddling into things that we cannot prove. Just as soon as I say something like that, someone's going to throw a scholar from me from Dallas Theological Seminary and tell me like, you're wrong. That's not what they say. And I refuse to do that. But there are many scholars out there who, who believe that those words were never spoken by Jesus. So what do we do with that? Why do we why do we have to hang on to these words that create this exclusive Christian club again talking about duality and non-duality? Why do we have to have that? Why can't we continue to be inspired by the words that we are sure he said or think he said or even just the presence of or the movement that was created around this person whose life impacted so much that it, it literally changed world history. Why can't we figure out ways that would just connect us with this indwelling presence and learn that our spirituality is better served to live in the curious and figure out ways to create a table of humanity that serves us all instead of trying to weaponize every, all that we believe that continue to just hack division between us it's not served anybody it's no longer sustainable and i believe that the gen zers and and uh, beyond that younger than that are done with it they're done with anything that has anything to do with patriarchy it used to terrify me to think about what bishop spong wrote in his book christianity must change or die but i believe it now because having a chokehold on these kinds of beliefs because it's God's way is going to be proven wrong that this that we we evolve beyond religious traditions and practices it's a given that we do don't forget that 
Christianity was entrenched in Nazism at a time. Christianity was used to justify slavery here in America. Thankfully, those movements did not make it. They did not survive. That part of Christianity died. It got cut off. Yes, are elements of it still living? And we're seeing it show up in racist people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Ron DeSantis? Absolutely. But it's up to us to meet to meet this uh, tension and say, I refuse to have my faith weaponized by what you're doing, by, by creating this homophobic, transphobic, racist society based on your belief that isn't even close to the true teachings of Jesus. There's never a time where you can justify using it. And history has proven that time and time again, that that level of bigotry cannot survive. And I'm sorry that it took me so long to awaken my eyes to it because I'm clearly a boomer, but I will do whatever I can to leave this earth a better place than what I found it and my contributions to, to, to the harm I caused when I was indoctrinated into this belief system. I don't even know where I am and what I said. Jenny wrote a little bit about what she had believed. And she said that she believed that God was a source of energy for her. And I believe in the divine living within each of us. And I can tell you that this is a beautiful example of what it looks like to deconstruct from those indoctrinated, indoctrinated beliefs, reach back into your religious heritage and reconnect with the things that still inspire you without weaponizing them. Jenny just modeled that for you. I have that video on, on my uh, feed and TikTok. You can also find that teaching in Patreon. But I just want you to know this. It is never either believe this or go to hell. There is always another option. And with time, we can learn discernment and the guidance of this when we have wise teachers that we're listening to and you are willing to sit in the discomfort with those indoctrinated beliefs that you have inside you and you're willing to look at them. That's how we reclaim our spirituality. That's how we release those biases and prejudices. And that's how we go back and see the harm that some of them have done when we have entrenched ourselves in such a rigid dogma that we refuse to see the humanity in other people. We're more focused on being seen as part of this exclusive club instead of our faith showing how we should invite the world to our table. And blessed be. Now, I did put a footnote on the blog that says, uh, in the dual, when I was talking about duality, I said, believe this or go to hell. I no longer believe in the literal hell either. Just going to put that out there. And I can teach about that sometime if you'd like to hear it. Okay, beloveds, thank you for listening. You can watch the uncut version of today's episode on my YouTube uh, channel, Spirituality Matters with Rev Carla. Check out my Patreon to access unique opportunities, including bonus content, live Q&A sessions, and support from a community of spiritual not, but not religious uh, souls like yourself. Coming soon, we'll be expanding and adding additional tiers to create a spiritual community like no other. You can always connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and on our websites at revcarla.com and numasoul.com. And now, beloveds, I'm honored to be in this space with you. I pray you receive something I know I did because the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.